Like a hat. As you can see, I'm pretty short. So <laughs> I wish there was a box that I could stand up on here. Let me take off my mask. Come on, more than that. Yay, go! Yay, go! Also, I have to apologize. Uh, she, uh, you probably hear him over there on that side. Haji, where did they go? Inlay. Well, let me start off by introducing myself to you all. Yat e she e Colton show nin she, tohed lini nin shle, tohed chini bashi chini kia ani dashi che, te bahan dashi nelle, ve di dashi nelle de ke hashte, akonde hosdo de na sha, ke o before ba na shnesh, ado ado honi thigi nin shle. Someone told me that meant news anchor in Navajo. I can't. I can't in Sago. I can't the Hadi Nas Dashdot Nigi. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me here today. It's a very special day for you all, and I am so uh, humbled to be invited with your special moments. So thank you to everyone up on the stage here. They told me that was the VIP section over there, so thank you over there as well. And most of all, I want to thank you all who are sitting in front of me right now, uh, the class of 2021. I see that you are with your family members, and I'm sure they're so proud of you. So right now, I want you guys to give yourselves a round of applause because you guys did a lot of work to get here. Come on, more. So, I like that the wind died down just a little bit. Hopefully, we can keep it like this. You might be thinking how I got here, how I got to this point, standing on this very stage right now. I can see the hope in your eyes, and I can see the your family members also very proud of you with your amazing family and your supporters in attendance. So you might be expecting this long, drawn-out story about hard work, sacrifice, and risk-taking. Now, don't worry, I'll get to that in just a moment. But actually, what got me here on this sunny, windy afternoon started with Danette College sliding into my DMs. My Facebook page, to be specific. Do any of the graduates even use Facebook? No? Well, as an elder millennial, that's someone over 30, apparently. I still scroll the Facebook feed. So I get this notification on my phone, and I open it, right? And it says, we, Danette College, are pleased to invite you to the 2021 Danette College Spring Commencement Ceremony. We'll mail you a formal letter, but for the time being, hopefully, you save the date. I hope you consider this. So my initial response, oh my gosh, how cool is this? Initial, they want me to be a commencement speaker at Danette College. No one was home with me, so... I was talking to my dog. After I said yes, very excited about it. But then, of course, the anxiety started to knock on my door. What are you going to say? How are you going to say it? What kind of advice are you even qualified to give? Well, I still don't know. But 10 years ago, graduates, I was in your very seat, and I was wondering about the next stage in life. Let me bring this down just a little. I was wondering what I was going to do, and I was wondering who I was going to become. Now, to tell you the truth, I don't even remember who the commencement speaker at my graduation was. 
So, seriously, don't worry. I won't be offended if you can't remember that I spoke at your graduation 10 years from now either. But maybe something I say will stick. Today is your day. And I am so proud of you. Everyone here is celebrating a big win for you. Now remember this feeling because it's going to help you as you move forward in life, especially as you encounter challenges and just kind of are unsure about what's going to happen next. So I want you guys to do a little exercise with me. So the graduates, um, I want you to close your eyes, all of you. Close your eyes. I can see you all. And take a deep breath, and I'll do it with you. And during this time, just think about what it took you to get here. The sacrifice, the cost, time away from others, the late night studying, writing those last minute papers. I've been there. I actually wrote this speech when I was stuck in traffic down the road. <laughs> just kidding. So every day I get to tell someone else a story, which is a very surreal experience. People open up to me and give me details about their lives so that I can better understand the situation they're going in or they are in. But today, I'll tell you my story. My name is Colton Schoen, and I am a journalist. Now, you may have seen me on your television screen early in the morning. Who am I kidding? You're probably all still in bed. Especially you college grads. But if not, you may have seen a story or two of mine get shared on the Facebook or even Instagram. So here's a pretty interesting story that I'll tell you about. As part of my job, you guys know that I'm on television every single day, weekday morning, right? And beyond the headlines, the breaking news, and the stories of the day, I also get to talk about my life. You may have seen that I talk with my co-anchors and the weather guy, uh, Steve Stucker. You guys probably all know him. He's, he's famous. But we get to talk about aspects of our life that aren't scripted. We talk about our families. We talk about just things that we, we still hope to achieve and what we like to accomplish. So every day I am humbled when someone comes up to me and tells me that they feel like they know me and that in a way I'm part of their family because they're inviting me into their home every day. Let's see if this wind kind of dies down. And of course, along with my job comes a lot of perks, right? So viewers are so awesome. They're so sweet. They send us gifts all the time. Like, I'm not lying to you. They'll, they, they'll send blankets. They'll send uh, ties. They'll send face masks and things of that nature. Not just me, but everybody. Uh, because they feel like they're so connected to us, which we really appreciate. Well, here's the story that I'm getting to. A very loyal viewer from uh, the Four Corners area, she sent me a tie. It was made from a bluebird flower bag. And it kind of went viral after I posted onto my social media. I took a picture of myself wearing the tie while doing the news. And on that very day, something interesting happened. And it hasn't happened since, really. But viewers were taking pictures of me on their television screen with the bluebird flower uh, print on the tie. One person called me Navajo Tom Brokaw. Hot e dot Tom Broca. Adza. But here's the thing. I think simply wearing that tie with that instantly recognizable logo, which I see out in the crowd right now, really made a big statement. It made a big statement for our people. Because as we know, bluebird flower is a staple ingredient for, uh, for many of us, especially for me at uh, Shemasana's house. You know, we use it for the fry bread, the tortillas, the dumpling stew. 
So I think me wearing that tie really resonated with our people on another level. Now, I was told this really cool story that I take to heart, and whenever I think about it, it, you know, warms me. I was told this story, and I'm going to paraphrase, but a parent had said that their young child watches me on the news every morning and says, he's Navajo just like me. So when I was a little kid, I knew I wanted to tell stories on the big screen, on the little screen. And in seventh grade, I begged my mom for a camcorder. Uh, you graduates probably don't know what that is. But it was about this big here, and it recorded video. Not like uh, what we have on our phones nowadays. And uh, seriously, you had to stick a tape into it. There was a button that you clicked, and it would open, and then you would put the little tape inside, and then you would close it up, and that's what you would use to record your movies on, or your videos or events. So yeah, totally different from things like today. And at just 12 years old, little Colton was running around the washes just a few miles that way. I made my sister and cousins star in my little horror movies. So being 12 years old, I didn't have any editing software or really didn't know how to do that. But I felt like a director. I would yell cut after scenes and I would stop the recording just so I could pause between dialogue so one person's face could be here. I'd say pause, cut, and then I'd put the camera on the other person and I would record the dialogue. So here's kind of a, a dramatic interpretation of, of what I did. Okay, Sha, did you hear that? The guy. Hey, Sean. Yee, yeah? Except it wasn't in Navajo, and it wasn't that dramatic. But I really love to create and tell stories. And so as I grew older, I wanted to become a journalist and report on the stories that I didn't think were getting enough attention. Stories that affected our people and other Native American tribes. As mentioned, I did grow up in Phoenix, and I was able there to see two television reporters who were Native. Mary Kim Titla from the San Carlos Apache tribe, and also Andy Harvey, another Diné reporter. I actually profiled them for a documentary that I did while I was in college, and it was called Silent Voices, Natives in the TV Newsroom. In this documentary, I explored the lack of representation in TV newsrooms when it comes to us and how this can be harmful, how it can perpetuate negative stereotypes, and that we lose out if we're not telling our own stories with our own perspective. And that was the message that the two journalists shared with me also. They also shared with me their stories of, of challenges in getting hired or climbing the ranks. Now, like I said, I did grow up in Phoenix, but I consider this sacred place home. Uh, my mom's family is from down the road in Lukachukai. Lucky Chucky, Danila. LA, too. Now, my dad, who is no longer with us, was from Pinon, Arizona. And we'd come back very often, taking part in ceremonies, herding sheep, having big family and holiday get-togethers. Now, many of you right before me have also shared experiences doing that as well. And it's those experiences that made me who I am today. They afforded me a different life perspective that most people have working in newsrooms across the country right now. When I was in my third year of college at ASU, I was getting deep into my broadcasting program then. I don't remember seeing any other Navajos or any other natives in any of my classes. So this one time, we came back from break, and the professor asked us casually, what did you guys do over break? Someone got engaged. Uh, someone said they just stayed here and just worked and all that stuff. And I said, oh, I went back to the res. Now, he was curious, and he wanted to know a little bit more about that. Well, this 
turn into a big discussion about how different life here is. Many students in my classroom didn't know about the issues with lack of electricity, running water, and just how remote it can be out here. And I told him, somehow it got brought up that my grandparents just got electricity to their house just a couple years ago, and this was in 2010, and that it was a decades-long battle for them to, gra to get electricity. So what did Professor Rodriguez make me do? He wanted me to write about that. So I'm going to share a few paragraphs that really, I think, started my career in terms of highlighting our people. For more than 80 years of his life, William Yazi didn't know what it was like to flick a switch in his own home and have light flood the room. While others could eat in their living rooms in front of blaring television sets, Yazi ate his dinner over a kerosene lamp in silence. If nature called in the middle of the night, he didn't have the luxury of walking down the hall to go to the bathroom. Yazi would have to answer by fumbling in the dark for a nearby flashlight and walking a hundred yards in pitch darkness to the outhouse he built himself. Yazi first asked his chapter his chapter house for electricity in 1967. And for the next four decades, he campaigned relentlessly, insisting that the power lines be extended to a small house in a remote corner of the Navajo Reservation in northeastern Arizona. The lines finally reached him in 2008. Still, more than 18,000 households on the reservation are waiting in the dark. And according to the Navajo Tribal Utility Authority, the largest utility provider on the reservation that number accounts for 75% of all U.S. households without electricity. Nowhere in the entire country are there so many people without power, despite millions of dollars in federal grants that were supposed to bring electricity to parts of the Navajo Nation. William Yazi is my Che. That means grandfather in Navajo. While we share the same clans, bloodline, and DNA, we were brought up in very different worlds. I was born and raised in Phoenix. I never thought twice about the electricity going through the apartments I've lived in. I never thought twice about having running water. I never thought twice about having grocery stores within walking distances of my home. But for Che, it was a different story. Born and raised within the boundaries of the four sacred mountains, Yazi has lived in Lukachike his entire life. The Navajo belief is that the Creator placed them on the land that falls inside of the four important sacred mountains. Sisnajini, Tzodzit, Dog Osli, Dbensa. His driver's license gives the address one three quarter mile southwest of the Thriftway on Indian Route 12. That Thriftway doesn't exist anymore. It was a convenience store and gas station, but the name was changed to Mustang a few years ago. I think it's Speedway now, right? I remember when I was younger thinking how out of place was the light glowing from that store at night. It was a different bright fluorescent blue-white glow, much different from the orange dots that scattered the rolling hills of Likachikai. Those dots represented houses with electricity. While the bright glow of the gas station remains unchanged, the town's nighttime landscape certainly has there are now more bright orange dots. I also saw you guys are building a school out there too. So really, that story kind of started it all with me wanting to commit to reports on issues affecting Indian country to get the stories out there that weren't being told in the mainstream media. As I mentioned, the people in my classroom had no idea that this was the way of life for many people up here on the Navajo Nation. Just different, you know, we, different, just different. So in the last decade, as I've become a working journalist, I've been able to get more of these stories out there from the missing and murdered indigenous people crisis that's rocking Indian country, also to cultural preservation and language preservation stories I'm able to tell it with the respect and the perspective 
that many people have. I bring this to every newsroom that I've ever worked in. So representation matters. We've been hearing that a lot lately, and it absolutely does. Most recently, I was able to bring my background to probably the most important story of my career, the Navajo Nation's fight against COVID-19. It's been a tough year for our people. It's affected the way we gather, pray, and it's affecting everything right now with the way we celebrate your achievements. The last update that I checked showed that the Navajo Nation had lost 1,282 people. So I helped produce and report a series of stories that culminated into the documentary called The People Versus the Pandemic. I, along with my colleagues, wanted to go deeper into the health inequities affecting the Navajo Nation and how funding setbacks at the federal level have perpetuated these inequities to exist. And the main message I got from those who I interviewed was that we as Diné are strong and resilient. And that is a notion I too wholeheartedly agree with. When it comes to representation, I think I'm seeing it a lot more now than ever before. And you may have too. Navajo filmmakers, Navajo actors, PhDs, lawmakers, lawyers, other journalists, doctors, and yes, TikTokers. They're really creative. I spend hours watching them. We all deserve a seat at the table. And sometimes it might be a fight to get your spots, but it's a fight worth taking on. All right. I could really go on and on and on about me. But today, May 7th, 2021, is your day. Now, honestly, I don't think that I can tell you anything new that you haven't heard before when it comes to achieving goals in your life. You've heard it many times before from your parents, your grandparents, your professors, and they probably all sound like uh, work hard, show up, and believe in yourself. Know that you matter, and you have your own perspective that's worth hearing. Another thing I'll tell you about me is I wake up every morning at 2.30. People always ask me all the time, what time do you wake up? And I'm like, 2.30. And they say, oh, what time do you go to sleep? And I say, 9. But my son keeps me up all night. So I wake up very early before sunrise, and I pray every day to the holy people so that they'll recognize me and keep me and others protected and to help me achieve my goals. You've heard this. I've been saying that every morning for years. So as I finish up my speech, there are a few takeaways that I would like you to just keep in mind. You know, you're not going to remember everything I said, and that's totally cool. But here are just 10 things I think that you guys should keep with yourself in you so that you may be able to move forward in life happier and more successful. So number one, be flexible, all right? We may have plans about what we envision ourselves to do, but life happens and just go with the flow. Be kind. You never know what someone else is going through. A simple smile and acknowledgement can really go a long way. Speak up. If you believe something isn't right, voice your concern. Think on it. Learn to make fry bread. No explanation needed here. Dinek etchigadaltke. Speak Navajo without fear and shame. I grew up in a household where my mom and dad both spoke Navajo fluently. And they would speak to me in Navajo, but didn't really press me to speak it. So what I learned was from them, but also classes like the ones you're taking here at the Net College. Uh, also, just really investing myself in it, especially during the pandemic. Uh, and also for my son, so that he also would be able to hear it. 
It's a process, and it's hard. Oh, you're not, uh, but you can do it. Also, this is mine. Please clean up after yourself, because no one likes living with a messy person, right? And here's a, another important one. Watch KOB 4 Monday through Friday, 4.30 to 7. Also, please, 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 I'm begging you. Ashonde, dream big. If you can believe it, you can achieve it. Travel. It'll give you a huge appreciation for other cultures. And this one here is my favorite, and it's the last one. Create. When I was waiting in line over there, I, I spoke to one of the graduates who is receiving his certificate today, and I asked him what he was getting it in, and he said silversmithing. That's incredible. Whether it's writing, rug weaving, silversmithing, beading, woodworking, TikTok videos, there's really nothing better than saying, oh yeah, I made that. Kare Bija, congratulations, class of 2021. We are all so proud of you. Please, let me know how you're doing 10 years from now, but I'm sure that you're going to be doing great. Okay.